Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us here today on the final day in our annual week-long observance of lesbian visibility. Um, what better way to mark the ending of this sacred week than by celebrating the 25th anniversary of Tipping the Velvet, a landmark piece of lesbian literature. But we're not just celebrating the book, we are celebrating the author, Sarah Waters, whose canon of work has broken down stereotypes and helped pave the way for more diverse representations of lesbian identity and experiences in popular culture. Today, lesbians have a mainstream cultural presence that would not have felt poss possible back in 1998. It's a revolution Sarah Waters has played an instrumental part in, beginning more than 25 years ago when she began to carefully craft the gripping odyssey of Nancy Astley, the rise, fall, and rise of a Whitstable oyster gal, and continuing through her other novels set across the Victorian, Edwardian, and World War II eras. Miss Waters will join me on stage later, but first, my name is Caroline. Um, I'm a freelance film and events programmer, and I will be your host today. And I'm actually really honored to have the opportunity to do this because I was first introduced to tipping um, through the BBC adaptation uh, when I watched it alone in my bedroom at 14. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and yeah. Obviously, at 14, you have a lot of questions, don't you? And I can, I can tell you that watching that show answered all of my questions. <laughs> and the answer to all of those questions was, you're a lesbian, <laughs> of course. So it was a real awakening, um, as it no doubt was for many people in the queer community and beyond, who enjoy Sarah's works for their intricate plots, detailed historical language and settings, and vividly drawn characters that keep you gripped from the first page until the last. Her work pays attention to women's secret history and addresses complex lesbian experiences from the past, reminding people that we have always been here. She's been a much needed voice, and we will hear that wonderful voice soon when I can thank her in person for making me a lesbian. <laughs> But now we will screen the first episode of that BBC adaptation. Then we will go straight into a 15 minute break. You can use the toilet, uh, grab another drink or book. Then after the break, I will be joined by Sarah to talk about her book, its impact and her influences. Some of which, by the way, are available from our friend Uli at Gaze the Word over there. Um, he has, cur well, we, we've curated a selection of titles that have inspired Sarah, and Gaze the Word are London's oldest LGBT bookshop, so please check them out if you haven't already. Check out their website. They also have an incredible program of events and a lesbian discussion group every Wednesday. Um, the conversation with Sarah will be followed by an audience Q&A and then a book signing before fin finishing around 5.30ish. Um, I would like to do a quick shout out to our friends at the fantastic Out and Wild Festival. <laughs> um, the UK's first wellness festival designed for queer women held in Wales every June. There are dozens of activities from wild swimming to workshops on the menopause and not forgetting cinema, which I will be there programming. And we are hoping to show all three episodes of Tipping. So if you wanna catch the rest of the series, just come to Wales in June. Um, the conversation and Q&A will also be recorded and made available on the museum's YouTube channel and it's also going to be stored at Bishopsgate Institute's LGBTQIA plus archive. Um, and lastly, we are also raising awareness for the Save the Cinema Museum campaign, which aims to secure this beautiful, unique heritage former workhouse that was once home to Charlie Chaplin as a permanent home for the museum. And after 15 years of campaigning, the museum has now signed a four-year lease with the option to purchase at any time. And the purchase of this venue will allow them to continue sharing their love of film and cinema and all their other pro-environmental projects that bring positive social changes in the local and wider community. You can support this campaign in many ways by donating or buying something from the shop or bar or checking out their incredible program and coming to screenings, following them on social media or simply telling your friends about the place. Every little helps, especially in a cost of living crisis. So thank you all for listening. Let's get on with the show. Enjoy it. And I'll see you after the break.
Sorry to leave you all hanging with just the one episode, but that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Um, I've seen the series hundreds of times, of course, but if you haven't, then no problem. You can, like I said, come to Wales in June, <laughs> or if that's too much, watch the episodes on Amazon Prime. Um, and I recommend watching the show when you're actually in Whitstable 2, because that is a very immersive and holy experience. Um, for the people who have never seen the full series before, the next hour is going to be riddled with spoilers, so I do <laughs> apologize for that. Um, I'll make a very brief introduction for my next guest now, as you all know who she is. Our star of the show was born in Wales on the 21st of July, 1966, which makes her a cancer. <laughs> and if you know your zodiac, um, that means she is homely, creative, nurturing, loyal, and has a strong intuition. And all of these qualities stand out across her award-winning novels. Um, she earned her PhD in 1995. In 2019, she was awarded an OBE for her services to literature. She's our modern day Sappho. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sarah Waters. some water if you want it. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us. Look at, your, look at your beautiful audience. I know. Thank yeah. you. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Thank you. Good. It's lovely to be in this wonderful venue. I live just down the road, which was even nicer. <laughs> um, and I have, I've done um, an event here before, and I've been to things here, and I hope you'll agree. It's absolutely splendid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's it is lovely to see you all here. I didn't know who was going to come. You know, I just thought, who's going to want to see Tippy in the Velvet now? again no. and again? <laughs> well, yeah, we, I mean, we're sold out, so quite a lot of people want to see Tip in the Velvet, so, which is great. Um, so I want to begin by taking you back to February 1998. Um, it was a great month. The Angel of the North was installed. Elton John was knighted. Um, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On is at the top of the charts. <laughs> and Tip in the Velvet was released. The so, book, yep. Yep. so tell me what you were doing 25 years ago in February. I was living in Dalston uh, with my partner at the time. And I'd, yeah, I was um, teaching very part time for the Open University, but mainly trying to write. Because by then, obviously, I'd finished Tipping the Velvet. I'd finished, I wrote it first in. 1995, as soon as I finished my PhD, I started work on it as a novel. I'd had this idea for it and thought, why not? And I was only 29, I suppose, and um, used to living on not very much money, having been a student, and um, just thought, I'm going to give it a go. So I did, and I wrote it really very quickly. I mean, much more quickly than I would write a novel now. It does kind of show, I think. But anyway, um, and then so I sort of, it took me a while to get a publisher, it took me a while to get an agent, and then I finally got my agent and then got a publisher 97 so it came out in 98 okay. um, and by that point I'd already started work on my next book Affinity so I was really hooked on writing by then um, yeah and uh, just just kept going since then did you have a launch party when it came out I had a little launch party in if any of you know it's not there anymore but there was used to be a bookshop and cafe called Centerprise anybody remember Centerprise in Dalston uh, which was a kind of community bookshop. It was great, actually, and it had uh, lots of sort of uh, black fiction and uh, gay fiction and women's fiction. It was it was very it was a proper community bookshop, and I'd, I'd got to know the bookseller there, Judith, and so she kindly offered to have a little launch for Tipping the Velvet, which seemed this all seemed. I mean, you know, I mean, when you start writing a book, you just have no expectation that it will get published. Obviously, I hoped it would. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it was just, it was wonderful to be published. And published by Virago, who I'm still published by. Yeah. Virago committed to publishing books by women, mainly, not, all, not always, but, um, and feminist books, and, you know, has a great history of, of publishing. So I'm, I was thrilled to be published by them. Um, as it's Lesbian Visibility Week, and we want to stay on topic, um, <laughs> you were out and proud, as they say, before the release of Tipping, but suddenly you go from being out to out, out to the whole world. Was that something that you thought about? Well, you say suddenly. I mean, Tipping did well 
amongst lesbians quite quickly. You know, I was really aware of that. <laughs> it, got, it was a real word of mouth sort of book, and you know, there was a lesbian bookseller in books, etc., in Bishopsgate, I think, Rachel Swindlehurst, who like hand sold like 50 copies or something just by sort of saying to people, you might like this. You know, so people got behind it very quickly, and the, but they did tend to be mainly lesbians. And so that was as far as I ever sort of imagined, really. You know, I was. Tipping the Velvet, for me, writing Tipping the Velvet came totally out of my reading of lesbian and gay fiction and women's fiction, and there was a lot of it around in the 90s. You know, there were lots of small presses publishing lesbian and gay writing. I mean, I say lesbian and gay because that's how we referred to it at the time. It was very much, you know, and then it sort of began to be LGB, and it's sort of extended since then, quite rightly. But, you know, it, was, it was very, did feel very much like a sort of lesbian and gay world in the 90s that the book came out of, and obviously, you know, sort of speaks to that world. It's, I mean, it's a period piece, um, belongs to that world, really. So, um, yeah, I never really imagined it would get a wide readership. So it, 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 and it just began to build quite slowly, you know, over the next couple of years. So yes, it did kind of out me, which actually I think was a bigger deal for my parents, living in <laughs> a very, very small town, not far from the out and wild place in Lorraine, in, down in Pembrokeshire, uh, you know, living in a very small town. I remember when I was writing the novel, I said to my mum, I'm writing a novel. And she said, oh, great. She said, what's the heroine called? So I said, oh, Nancy. She said, what's the hero called? <laughs> and I said, well, it's kind of another heroine, actually. <laughs> so it was always a bit, oh, right, you know. And, and then, of course, once it was on telly, it really did out me. Maybe it did them a favor in a way. They didn't then have to Pick do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> what's your daughter doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, yeah, there was, there's all that sort of side of things that you don't really think about when you yeah. start off writing. But no, it was very great. And of course, the adaptation was what really, you know, took, raised my profile and sold a lot of books. I mean, I seem to remember, I mean, the first print run of Tipping the Velvet was 5,000 copies. It seemed great. You know, it seemed very respectable at the time. And I think in the first two weeks of it being on telly, we sold like 60,000 copies. You know, it was a, and it was, it just got a lot of mainstream attention. Um, some of it a bit salacious, but mainly <laughs> quite... I was, it was just exciting at the time. And also it didn't, you know, I would have hated it if, if my sort of lesbian readers had been kind of pushed out or something mm. of the mainstream. But actually, there was a lot of excitement amongst lesbians as well about the adaptation. So it, to me, it felt great. It, it was just lovely. Mm. Well, so as I mentioned, I had Tip in the Velvet for my lesbian <laughs> awakening. <laughs> what, what did you have? <laughs> what was your tipping? <laughs> What was my tipping? I think it was more of a sort of drip feed of things, you know. This, so I would have been a young teenager in, like, about 1980 time. I was 14 in 1980, and I just remember noticing things on telly. And, you know, the, for anybody of my age, or I, I don't know how old you are, but you know what I mean, for anybody who's a bit older, there was so little around that when things came along, you really fastened onto them, didn't you? So I remember, like, watching Cabaret, for example, when I was about 14, um, and there isn't even a lesbian bit, but there's a gay bit where he, oh, Michael York and Liza Minnelli, so young and gorgeous. That's the thing about getting old. I mean, he, Keely and Rachel, don't they look sort of gorgeous and young and just luscious? And anyway, there's the bit where she says to him, screw Maximilian, and he laughs and says, um, I do, you know, or something like that. And it's like this tiny gay moment. And similarly, in Rocky Horror Show, I remember seeing that with my boyfriend, who later came out as gay. We were both... Uh, <laughs> Well, we were like 80, absolutely transfixed by Rocky Horror Show, which is mainly, of course, about gay men, really. Oh, but there's a tiny lesbian bit in that as well that I really, really sort of fastened on to. So it was an accumulation of things. And then uh, finally falling in love with, um, with another girl at university in Whitstable, I have to say, because I was at Kent. And so uh, we lived in a house in Whitstable right on the beach. In fact, you can see it in the distance at one point. Um, and it was very, we were very closeted. So this was 1985, uh, late 1985, November the 6th, if you, to be precise, <laughs> 1985. Um, and um, we, were, we, were, we stayed really very closeted for, for a few years. But it was, uh, in a funny sort of way, the secrecy of it, in a way, added to the kind of excitement. So it was very romantic. So yeah, Whitstable has a lot to yeah. answer to. <laughs> I feel like as well, when I went there, there were so many lesbians. Like now they have a pilgrimage to Whitstable. <laughs> you know, it's part of a rite of passage. Um, okay, so 
Tipping was inspired by the research that you did for your PhD, which I'll just tell you the title of your PhD thesis was Wolf Skins and Togas, Lesbian and Gay Historical Fictions, 1870 to the Present. Is yep. that right? Yeah. Yep. Sounds very specific, but also expansive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mean the dates? Yeah, 1870 to, to the, the present, present, which of yeah. course was that present. You know, things have moved on an awful lot now in um, queer scholarship and queer life generally. So it was, yeah, it was sort of, it was looking at how we've written about the queer past, the lesbian past, the gay past, um, and how, you know, the way we write about the queer past changes as models of queerness change and have changed yeah. over the over about a period of sort of 150 years. Um, Yes, and it ended up looking at modern day lesbian and gay historical fiction, which I was reading a lot of at the time. Um, so, I mean, thinking of books that were a big, it had a big impact on me, there were things like Patience and Sarah, do any of you know that? Isabel Miller, absolutely lovely novel from, I think from the 70s, like an American, about two American women, based on the real lives of two women who sort of set up home together in the 19th century and she turns it into this lovely sort of lesbian love story. Um, Alan Galford was a writer. She wrote a book called Mole Cut Purse, about Mole Cut Purse and the Fires of Bride. You know, there was, like I was saying before, there was a lot of, um, there was just a lot of sort of self-confident lesbian and gay writing around in those days. There were, things, there were things like, do you remember the lesbian pantomimes at the drill hall they used to do every year? I absolutely loved those. Um, and that, yeah, so um, that was very much where the book came from. What was your question? I've forgotten now. <laughs> it, it wasn't really a question, it was just more of a comment on the title of your oh, yeah. thesis. I strayed a bit, was. didn't I? And you, you, yeah. brought the, um, you built the book from that research, right? From, yeah. Yeah, it was very much historical fiction and how we write about the past. But I, I was also interested, it, like I was saying, in this period, you know, you began to see lesbian detective stories and She Came Too Late. Do you remember that? The Mary Wings novel, um, lesbian sci-fi. Um, lesbian romance, gay thrillers. It was this time of, to me, it was a time of sort of queer people invading mainstream narratives. Yeah. So, I mean, there were literal invasions with things like, do you remember the, the p women, those, uh, those women who abseiled into the House of Lords to protest against Clause 28, and they invaded the six o'clock news, and it was this real time of sort of, yeah, sort of invading the mainstream, and that's, I suppose, what was part of what I felt able because of that, I felt able to do it with, you know, invading the Victorians, you know. Yeah. Uh, or, e I mean, I'd, I'd grown up watching things like the good old days with my nan, the music hall, you know, and just sort of, which is very sort of, there are, there are the cliches of stage, um, of, of melodrama and music hall life and, and panto, like I was saying, and just to be able to take that format but put lesbians into it or think, well, what would it have been like if you had been a lesbian or queer in some way? You know, what would it do to the genre to do that? So it was, that was all very much where, where the book came from. Because you've actually said in an interview that your books have a common agenda in teasing out lesbian stories from parts of history that are, are regarded as heterosexual. And also you've said that the very patchiness of lesbian history invites or incites the lesbian historical novelists, such as you, to pinch, to appropriate, to make stuff up. So in tipping, what was like, what was fact and what was fiction? I know it's all fiction, but what, any people or situations that you drew? Well, yes, I mean, there were two sort of things that fed into tipping, and one was just the work I'd done on late Victorian life, uh, sort of gay, the, the queer underworld of late Victorian life. You know, most of the info about which I knew was about gay men, really. Or, I mean, the terms are all approximate. You can't really call them gay. It's all an anachronistic, you know, sort of Oscar Wilde and Rent Boys and those sort of cross-class cross, cross class liaisons um, that were very much part of sort of queer male life in the late 19th century. So I knew all that world, and I sort of thought, mm, what would, how could you use that for lesbians, maybe, in a way? And then the other big thing was male impersonation in the music halls, because I'd already got interested in that, and I'd already, I still do, my nerdy hobby, collecting old postcards, and that you can find wonderful, wonderful images of some of the, you know, the, the male impersonators of the day. People, Vesta Tilly was the most well-known, Hetty King, Victorian, Edwardian era. Uh, and they were just like, you know, like Kitty with the wonderful dapper outfits. And they were sort of, often their acts were sort of part, 
satire, they'd sort of be poking fun at men and at masculinity, but also a sort of homage to masculinity as well, an enjoyment of the freedoms of masculinity, claiming it for a kind of female performer. So I was really taken with that. I mean, it's hard not to look at those images or, and, and not see something queer going on. They look like drag kings or they look like, you know what I mean? I think for most of the audience, they were just part of mainstream entertainment. You know, like it, when I was a kid going to Panto, you would still see uh, principal boys. You know, the, the sort of Prince Charming would st might still be played by a boy. And for most people, that's just, like I say, it was very anodyne. But I think for me as a little tomboy watching that, you know, I do, you know, I remember going to the Swansea, seeing, seeing pa the principal boys in Cinderella and being quite taken with that. So I think for some spectators of this kind of thing, there'd always be an extra charge that we might want to call queer or something. And somebody like Vesta Tilly is fascinating because she, you know, she was very, um, she was a sort of satirist of masculinity. She had lots of fun with, with masculinity. She also took care not to be too threatening. She was very diminutive and she made herself kind of a safe figure in lots of ways. She sort of was, you know, she was a great, a very shrewd businesswoman. So there were, you could get lots of images of her and you could, she'd sell like, Vesta Tilly waistcoats and things like that. You know, she had her own kind of range, but she but she was very careful to have pictures of herself in her feminine garb as well. You know what I mean? To kind of make it clear that it was an impersonation. And she talks in her autobiography about having very very passionate female fans. You know, fans female fans who would follow her everywhere and send her love letters basically. And and she's but quite yes, yeah, she's quite condescending about them really. And of course. I don't, we don't know how Vesta Tilly experienced what she was doing and all this kind of thing, but certainly the way she chose to present it to the world was that it was, she was sort of making it a bit comical and a bit unerotic. So I suppose I just kind of thought, well, actually, what would it be like if there had been room for a more of a sort of erotic encounter between a, a male impersonator and her, and her passionate fan. You know, where could that have gone, I suppose, yeah. basically. That Perfect. was kind of it. Yeah, kind of like, I don't know, creating one story out of many, like the film Blue Jean recently. Ah, yes, I haven't seen it yet, actually. Ah, okay, yeah, you, yeah. Should, you should watch yeah. it. It's a, it's a great, it's a very important reminder mm. in our current mm. political climate. Um, but you, so you are renowned for the immersive way you can recreate any period through your rich use of language. Um, and that also goes for sexual historical language too. Um, making Nancy an oyster girl was genius and <laughs> really gave you an opportunity, a world of opportunities for innuendo and metaphors. And if I may read a couple of my favorite examples from the book, <laughs> hard to pick two, but okay. We fitted together like two halves of an oyster shell. You couldn't have passed so much as the blade of a knife between us. And that's one, page 132 for anyone <laughs> interested in skipping to that bit. Um, this one is actually my favorite. My quim, and you can guess what a quim is. Um, my quim, in the clever way of quims, was still quite slippery from the night of passion the night before. Page 302. <laughs> This is really great stuff, and you must have had a lot of fun. I had lots of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. Somebody said to me a couple of years ago, um, what do you feel reading Tipping the Velvet now? Because I had actually reread it quite recently. And what I, was I said what I was struck by was how moist it is. It's full of, <laughs> it's full of moisture and wet knickers, basically. And I said what it made me, mainly makes me feel is kind of nostalgic <laughs> and wistful. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a very, very moist novel. Yeah. Um, and I did have lots of fun with it. I probably do overdo it a bit at times. Um, I overuse the word queer. I have too much fun with the word queer and the word gay. Yeah. Um, and I'll, actually, the oysters, funnily enough, I hadn't really planned. I mean, I wanted to set it in Whitstable partly because, it, you know, it's a, it's a journey from innocence to experience. And I'd grown up by the sea in Wales uh, and lived in Whitstable. So I wanted her to make her a kind of seaside girl. Um, and of course, there is still a thriving oyster trade in, in Whitstable, so that felt right. And it was only when I was researching oysters that I realised that they are kind of hermaphrodite in some way. I mean, they're sort of, they can kind of go either way or something, or they're both at the same time. You know, something really interesting like that. So that felt really good. That felt really appropriate. Um, and yeah, the whole kind of erotic potential. I don't even like oysters, to be honest. I don't really <laughs> like them. But they do have a lovely 
something to them, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they really do. They really do. I've read that there's been fans who've turned like their favourite quotes into tattoos. Have anyone got Quim? Quim. Clever Quim. Or <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I have seen. I've been sent pictures of some of some tattoos actually, both for Tipping and for Fingersmith, my third book. So. Um, no, I haven't quite seen that. But you're saying it like that's a really like outre word, but I thought that was just quite a normal word, isn't it? Well, maybe it's what normal back then. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I like it. I, you know, I really love it. <laughs> um, the book is also, it's very sex positive, and, and also I, I feel like very sex worker positive too, um, because there's, there's a, a knowingness and an acceptance that's so empowering in the way that Nancy details her sexuality, um, especially at a time when women's access to sex education was you know, limited like, to like their female relatives, and Nancy's got her frigid sister Alice. <laughs> so was that like a conscious decision to be so sex positive? Yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, very much. I mean, partly, again, because even though I'd read so much inspiring lesbian fiction in the 80s and 90s, a lot of it was quite... I think there was a sort of a... There was a sort of a... Anxiety about being too sexual in the way you talked about about lesbian life, in case sort of in case men got hold of it, do you know what I mean? And read it the wrong way, like... Um, I remember that from, from some sort of some events I went to in like the late 80s. There was this anxiety about it. And I think by, by the mid-90s, lesbian culture had begun to change. There was the whole lipstick lesbian thing. It just felt a bit more looser. It was shushed, you know, the, uh, the sex toy shop that opened in the 90s. It all just began to feel a bit more relaxed. So I, was cer I certainly felt I benefited from that, you know, in the way I felt I could talk about lesbian sex in the book. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just wanted it to be um, fun and upbeat. I mean, not that we hadn't seen fun and upbeat representations of lesbianism before, but I was very aware of that sort of slightly older tradition of films and, and TV where the, all the lesbians ended up, you know, mad or dead or married <laughs> off or, or something. It was all a bit unhealthy. You know, it was all a bit unhealthy when I was growing up, when you see lesbians on, when you saw lesbians on telly. So I really I wanted to get away from that. Okay. And also, it wasn't true to my experience of being a lesbian in the 90s, which was full of fun, really, in my lesbian house share in Hackney. You know, it was fun. We had our own community. We, we, there was still a lot that was wrong with the world. But we, I, you know, I remember just feeling um, a lot of confidence about the fact that we were there and we had things to say and, we, and that there was sort of, we were, yeah, like we were, we were part of a community. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that reflected that sense of um, belonging and um, and excitement and and also um, I didn't I never wanted to write about homophobia as such. I mean, of course, there's Nancy encounters homophobia on her journey, but it always seemed to me that you know, yeah, of course, homophobia was there in all sorts of ways, in big and small ways. But actually, the sort of the people who you felt most passionate about and that the people who sometimes wounded you the most were other women, you know, as a lesbian, because you, it, was all, it was all about falling in love and desire and having a heart broken and that kind of thing. That was the people you were most engaged with, not, not, not the homophobes, really. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of try and capture that as well. Yeah. Well, what is so unique and wonderful about your work is its ability to trans transcend uh, gender and sexuality. Um, and I've read many reviews by self proclaimed straight conservative people who really connect deeply with your work and you know they say at the end of the day great fiction is great fiction but how does that make you feel well i mean it's been really interesting because as i say especially because at the first at first when i was doing events they they were small and the people who would come up and talk to me afterwards tended to be other you know other lesbians and then i remember beginning to do events where the, where the audience just looked a bit different and lots of the women looked a bit straighter, you know, and there were obviously a lot more straight people there. Um, and as I was saying before, that would have bothered me if I'd felt it was crowding out my lesbian readers as well, but it never seemed to me to do that. There seemed to be room for everybody. So, um, yeah, the fact that the books and, and Tipping the Bell, the, on the adaptation, and the subsequent adaptations, you know, found a mainstream audience too, just seemed great to me. Because after all, they are... I see, I've always felt funny about this. Sometimes people would say to me, oh, I don't see your books as gay. They're just stories about, you know, they're just stories for everybody. There's human stories. And I would sort of, yeah, kind of, but they are. The, the lesbianism is really important. You know, these, these are stories that couldn't be, they sort of, 
these these things happen to these women in the way they do because they're lesbians, you know, because they're lesbians. It's not that they're, they are, of course, they're humans as well, but I never wanted to um, pretend that that wasn't, a, that wasn't a big factor. Yeah. But at the same time, of course, they are just human stories too about falling in love and having your heart broken and feeling like a misfit. I mean, I felt like watching, watching it now very much, you know, it's, it's just very much about being young and awkward and your parents, not your family not understanding you and you have to find your own family, you know, you have to sort of find your, pr your sense of pride in yourself. It's very much, tipping the velvet is very much about that really and how yeah. you go about doing that and the sort of wrong turnings you take along the way and you get there in the end kind of thing. Well, I just want to say that I think tipping and your ad adaptations are responsible for inspiring the lesbian period drama craze or phenomenon, however you want to refer Fanny to it. Fanny by Gaslight, I've heard that called. It's <laughs> <laughs> great, isn't it? Yeah. The whole genre. <laughs> um, so it's like tipping walks so Ammonite could run, you know? <laughs> Like, did, did you ever oh, imagine that you... It's a shame Ammonite ever ran anywhere, <laughs> if you ask me, but never mind. Sorry, that's... Well, edit mean. that out. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, did, did, did you ever... Well, I mean, I suppose I asked you that, you know, did you imagine it would get to this? Did you, yeah, did you think 25 years since Tipping's release that you would be sat here at the Cinema Museum talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but actually the, weird, the weirdest phase was, was sort of early, probably the early noughties, when it really did take off, you know, because ma you know, probably mainly because of the television adaptation, and also think my book Fingersmith was out that year, and it got on a, in 2002, and it got on a couple of shortlists, and you know, suddenly I was getting a lot more attention, and there was a it, there was a lot of lesbian excitement, you know, at, in that period, funnily enough, and that was the bit that I that took me aback because I'd never, I just never expected that. Yeah. I remember doing. Did any has anyone here been to the York Lesbian Arts Festival? Why <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and um, that ran for a few years, and I went to that a few times. And you know, the first time I went to that after Tipping the Velvet had been on telly, it was just—it was re there was a lot of lesbian love, if I can put it like that. <laughs> so that was almost more startling than than being here in a funny sort of yeah. way. But this, I mean, this is this is lovely too, and this is lovely because, of course, I never really thought, oh, is Tipping going to continue to sort of appeal to people? You know, I, like I was saying at the start, queer culture has moved on. Um, and ha you know, has it has different sort of things it gets excited about now. So it's it's nice when people tell me that they they are you know they do still like tipping the velvets and and actually there was some TV interest in remaking it you know which would be very very couple of production companies very very early days so it may not come to anything but for me it's just exciting to think it still feels appealing you know, to people. And there was a great stage version a few years ago by Laura Wade at the Lyric Hammersmith. That was lots of fun. Um, you worked on that? Well I, well, I didn't work on it, but I was okay. just involved in the process and saw it in different phases, and it was absolutely delightful. And again, you know, Laura's a, a younger playwright, so the fact that sort of young women still come to it, the story, and find, find it relevant and want to sort of adapt it is really lovely. I think that's like the biggest honor that you can mm. get. But so the OG, the original adaptation um, that we just did, the episode that we just watched attracted nearly five million viewers when it was on, which is actually more than twice the usual audience for BBC Two on a Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> so that is about one in four viewers. And that means everyone of a certain age in the UK watched it or knows someone who watched it. Um, what did you think when it actually came out? That must have been so exciting. Yeah, it was really exciting. And, the, and I mean, I didn't, I, it took me a while to believe it was gonna, it just seemed mad, you know, because it was, I was first approached, it came on telly in 2002, which meant I think I was probably first approached in about 1999. That was by Sally Head, wonderful producers, Sally Head who first got behind it, and then they got Andrew Davis on board, which seemed crazy, because of course he was like the biggest, you know, adapter, um, biggest scriptwriter in the UK then, and obviously still has a huge profile, so that just felt balmy. I thought, this is never gonna happen, and he was very, he was great, actually, and I mean, obviously he's a straight man, but he was very behind it as a lesbian story, and said he would only do it if the BBC kept the dildo in, you know, and things like that, he just really, um, <laughs> And um, <laughs> no, no. but I, but I again, I thought there's no way this is going to get on B on BBC telly with all in all its sort of moistness. You know, I just thought <laughs> it's not going to happen. And then it just did. It just did. And of course, it just 
it, it just found the right moment, I think. Um, the BBC, you know, wanted to do something a bit a bit risque, and Sally Head wanted to do something that felt a bit edgy, and so it suit, kind of suited everybody. Um, but it did get a ridiculous amount of attention. And of course, it, you, you mean you say five million? It was at the e it was just right at the end of a kind of particular kind of telly watching culture, wasn't it? Before there were a billion channels, and you know, we telly watching was like a, more of a communal thing. You would sit, you wouldn't tape it so much, you might sit down and watch it. In fact, I think the Sun newspaper, I think one of the episodes, the middle one, which is the one with the dildo, anyway, that <laughs> coincided with a football match and the Sun newspaper printed the exact time that the blokes could turn over from the match and to catch <laughs> the rudest action and then go back. Which actually, I thought was quite funny, but yeah, it's so the sun, though. Yes, it? but it did get lots and lots of um, daft attention, really, as well as some very nice attention. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm just going to ask you one more question because we haven't uh, got much time, and I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions. So I just want to know, what's your favourite adaptation? Or ever, or of mine? Not of yours. <laughs> 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 well, I was always very fond of Fingersmith, actually, which. Um, which came out, which is quite old now, but, and I haven't watched it recently, and I suspect rather like tipping. They all seem very slow now, don't they? They're from, they, they're kind of, this, it's, they, they worked at a different pace. But Fingersmith was very faithful to the book, and it had Sally Hawkins in it, wonderful Sally Hawkins. What, one of the great things about watching this is you see all these faces, don't you? Like Benedict yeah. Cumberbatch and, Batch and Daniel Mays, and Monica no uh, Dolan, who's so good as the sister. Um, and Sally Hawkins pops up in the second episode, she was like really unknown then, and um, I remember saying to Andrew, "God, she's really, she's going to go places, isn't she?" That's Sally Hawkins, and I was right, because <laughs> um, they then cut apart from anything else. They then cast her for the main part in Fingersmith, with uh, the actress Elaine Cassidy in the other role. It's got Imelda Staunton, and it's just a lovely chemistry between those two characters. So I I always liked that very much. I mean, Tipping has a special place in my heart. Obviously, it was funny seeing it now. I haven't seen it in it for about twelve years. Okay. And I remember la last time I saw it thinking, ooh, it's a bit creaky, isn't it? And that, but funnily enough, I found it just kind of charming yeah. this time. It just, <laughs> it's got, it's become old enough now that you can just sort of, yeah, it's just quite charming, isn't it's it? It's nostalgic. It's nostalgic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we're going to have, yeah, you can clap. Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, we're just going to be two minutes while we set up the Roman mics. Um, I'll get the lights on. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I met you briefly. Um, just to say that um, I teach for a living, but I am an actor first and foremost, so I'd love to be in the remake. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how much involvement did you have with the casting? So Nina Gold, were, was Nan, were, were Keely and Rachel what you imagined when you were writing for um, Nan and Kitty? And just, I mean... Working with Nina Gold is, is a, you know, amazing in itself. So just how much involvement did you have in that side of things? I didn't really have any involvement in, in any of that, actually. I mean, you know, I've never been creatively involved with any of the adaptations, but I have liked to be included in the process. So my involvement would have been mainly talking to the producers, Sally Head, and to Andrew. Andrew and I had quite a lot of back and forth um, just about the characters and the motivation. So when it comes to things like um, casting, you know, that's entirely out of my hands. And so, Ke yeah, Keely actually is, is, I suppose, a bit how I'd imagined Kitty. Um, it's harder with Nancy because I always find when I'm writing from inside a character, I don't necessarily have a clear vision of them. Often my female characters are like looking really hard at other women, and so I have a very strong, you know, I, I describe the people they're looking at, but I don't really describe them very much. I mean, it's just things like, I think in the book, Nancy's blonde you know and obviously Rachel Sterling is dark so yeah so no it's always a, it's always a bit of a surprise who you, who you end up with but um, it was still a very it was a very happy process though I remember yeah anyone else over there Probably my all-time favourite book, um, fictional book, is Fingersmith. It's the only book that has made me gasp out loud on a bus going through <laughs> Elephant and Castle and having people looking at me. But aside of that, um, as, as a, I see you as a very much a historical writer, um, it, it, and it's probably a qu cheesy question, but if you had a time machine, what periods would you go back to where you think, oh gosh, I'd lo love to know this thing, and, and what would that thing be? God. God, it's difficult, isn't it? 
I mean, the further you go back, the stranger it gets, in a way, which is partly why I like writing about the Victorians, because they're, they're far enough back to feel different and foreign, but close enough that you can sort of hear them and laugh at their jokes and things like that. And because I spent, you know, three novels writing about Victorian London, or admittedly in different decades, I would quite like to be able to ping myself back to Victorian London and just hang about and listening to people talk to each other and maybe watch watch Dickens, you know, read a bit of a Little Dorrit or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's Yeah, I don't know. Probably the Victorians, if I had to choose one, but it would be really, really hard. I mean, there's nothing... I suppose I haven't got any sort of there are no mysteries I'd like to solve, but it would just be it would just be general hanging around, listening to people, watching people. Yeah. Thank you. Um, who's next? Over here, the front. Hi. Uh, Hi. Um, so I actually ended up doing my university dissertation on tipping the velvet. Um, <laughs> and kind of focusing on the age gap relationship between kind of Nan and, um, oh my goodness, my brain's gone completely blank. <laughs> Diana, <laughs> Diana. Um, And I wanted to ask kind of why but the role of Diana and having that kind of very detached um, woman from a different background who was much wealthier, different age group, why was she an important character to include for you? Because she feels very separate from a lot of the other characters, but I was always fascinated by her. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you don't know the story, Diana comes in, um, well, obviously it doesn't, it's not a, a good point between Nancy and Kitty when we left it there, and so Nancy, Nancy sort of goes off and then meets, it gets picked up, really, by a rich older woman called Diana. Um, who, who makes a bit of a sort of a sex slave out of her for a while. Um, well, she w came very much out of what I was saying, I suppose, earlier about looking at gay, queer men's lives from the late 19th century, which were often a cross-class, you know, sort of rich men kind of slumming it a bit and picking up. I mean, that's, that's being a bit negative about it. I think it was, it was a bit like that at times, a bit of rough trade kind of thing. But there were also r long and lasting and important relationships. But Edward Carpenter, for example, his, he had a working class lover, you know, and they, they, they were effectively married, you know, they lived together for years. And so, it, it, yeah, so I was thinking about how queer life manifested itself in the 19th century and how that's, what that might mean for, if I, if I sort of turned it into like kind of lesbian life, how that might work. And I wanted Nancy to, yeah, sort of take a wrong turning, you know, after she gets her heart broken by Kitty and just, um, yeah, so, God, actually, I mean, looking back now, I'm awfully mean to those kind of older, those posh older women, they're a bit ghastly. Um, and actually, one of the things I, even at the time, I didn't really like about the adaptation was that it makes, I mean, Di Anna Chancellor plays Diana, who's absolutely gorgeous, but lots of the other women in her circle they, they, they sort of make a bit grotesque, actually, sort of caricature them a bit as older women. And now as an older woman myself, you know, <laughs> I feel even less comfortable about that. But I feel a bit uncomfortable about the way I treated the older women in the book, too, because I just saw them as sort of awful toffs and, um, j you know, had sort of poked fun at them, really, which isn't very nice. Um, so, yeah, it was just about Nancy. I mean, there is a... Uh, yeah, Diana's 40 and Nan Nancy's, like, 20 two or something like that so it's not a massive age difference but it was definitely it was about a dynamic it was about Nancy being, being vulnerable and Diana having all the power you know in that relationship and and exploiting it thank you next question in the front second row hello hi first off I want to say thank you Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you for writing this amazing book. Um, because of Section 28, I didn't have access to it, so my first chance to engage with it was the TV adaptation. I was 16 in the year 2000 when it was released, and the first time that Kitty walked out on stage, I said, that is what I want to do. <laughs> 15 years on, I'm Europe's leading male impersonator. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> And I've inspired hundreds of other drag kings to step onto the stage. Um, it's been my legacy, but it is because of you. So thank you very, very much oh. indeed. Um, oh. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, thank you. I wanted to ask you, in the 90s, there was a hugely thriving drag king scene here in London. Did you witness any of it? Are you involved or do you see any drag kings now? 
I don't, I'm afraid. And even then, I was very much aware of it because it was sort of around and it was part of... But I, if I saw it happen, I remember going to something at the NFT for, for the les as it was, the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival where they had a drag king competition or something, which was great. And so I would see it to things like that, but no, I wasn't really... I was just very aware of it, you know, and, and excited by it, but I wasn't... Yeah, I, I wasn't much of a participant. And no, I'm not now, I'm afraid. Now I'm a bit old and sedate. Um, but we I can I take you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, yes, actually. Perhaps you should, because I ought to, really. And um, it's well, uh, congratulations. I mean, it's great to know it's still so... Um, is it? Yeah. How wonderful. Why do you think that is? Ah, uh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Brilliant. And, I mean, just amazing, really, that you can trace drag kingness in different forms, you know, back through a theatrical tradition, I think, for a long time. So anyway, thank you for sharing that. That's lovely to know. Thanks. It's a really good question. Thank you. Next question, back in the middle there. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you as well uh, for writing this book and all your other books. Um, my fiance and I actually met because of Tip in the Velvet, we, um, <laughs> and we were living, uh, she was in Brazil and I was in the UK and uh, that was two years ago and now we're getting married next month, so um, wow. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> um, um, but just as a question, um, I remember reading in the 20th uh, anniversary edition of the book, you said that there was kind of a question mark over Kitty and as mm. a kind of tragic figure. And if you were going to write a sequel, it would be maybe thinking about like her side of things and where she ended up. Do you still like think about that, or how do you imagine she might have ended up? Because she kind of disappears at the end. And yeah, yeah, poor Kitty. It, the book is a bit hard on her. Um, I've never seriously thought of writing a sequel, by the way. But oh, I no. just thought, you know, <laughs> it's more. I think it's more looking. You know, I, when I wrote Tipping the Velvet, I, I, I mean, I was. I, I'd never written anything before. You know, it was my, it was very much my first piece of fiction, let alone my first novel. So, and when I look at it now, I mean, it's it's got all the flaws that first novels have. You know, it's kind of all over the place and it's a bit undisciplined. And I don't really, if I was writing it now, I would give much more thought to all the characters, even the minor ones, and what was really going on for them and w what their backstories are and things like that. But Kitty is, I mean, you know, is just sort of rolled on to be Kitty and then rolled off again, but and, and then ends up. Yeah, just not in a not great place, really. But of course, what I was doing was punishing her for being so sort of closety and um, you know letting letting Nancy down and letting herself down, really, and just not being true to herself, uh, which uh, in the night you know in lesbian and gay nineties was the worst thing you could do would be sort of to be denying your own sexuality or something. I'd probably be a bit more forgiving of it these days. I don't know, but so yeah, she gets punished basically for for not being true to herself. Um, well, that is a bit mean. So I think if, if I was ever to write a sequel, I would think both about um, why she, well, I would think about why she was doing that. You know, what, what was going on for her? Where had she come from? Um, and yeah, where she, I mean, where she ends up is in a loveless marriage, really, with a man, you know, um, a beard kind of relationship. Um, having lost Kitty and lost lots of things, so that's a bit mean. So I might imagine a slightly different future for her as well. But I've never really... Uh, I mean, some authors, I think they sort of do imagine li the lives of their characters beyond the end of the book, and I've never really done that. I just... The book, you know, the characters serve the purposes of the book, and that's that. But I like to think that um, other people might speculate <laughs> about if they like the book, you know. They might and some, of course, some people have written fan fiction. That was another element of lesbian excitement about this book that some people have written, have written no, Kitty's story and sent me stories and things like that. And that's really nice. Thank you very much. Um, another question. I want any from this One side. Right Wait, you're going. You choose. There oh, you go. Sarah chose you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I was wondering, out of all of your books, is there any protagonist or character that you kind of relate to the most or have a particular affinity for? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I wrote Tipping the Velvet, I felt quite close to Nancy, although when I read the book now, I think, oh, she's a bit of a, she needs, a I've said this before, she needs to kick up the arse, Nancy. She's very, <laughs> she's very selfish in that way that you are, I think, when you're a bit young and a bit cocky. Um, 
so I don't feel close to Nancy anymore, but um, um, you, have to get, you have to get close to all your protagonists in a way, but yeah, there are some who mean more to me than others. So there's a character called Kay in, in a book of mine called The Night Watch, who's in a book where people do quite awful things. She, she's a real kind of hero. I mean, she's literally a hero. She's sort of an ambulance driver during the Blitz, so she's kind of rescuing people. And um, yeah, I liked Kay an awful lot. A lot. Not that I'm really, not that I really like her though. In my last book, that, that, um, it, it's kind of a love story. There were two characters called Francis and Lillian, and Francis is the main character. And um, again, I'm not really like Francis, but I felt very, very close to Francis. You know, I always knew what she would say, what she would think. That's always a great thing for a writer because sometimes you have to grope a bit to find that. But if you, you know, if you've got that immediacy of relationship with a character, that's that's really great. And I certainly felt it with Francis. So. Yeah, I was very f sad to finish that book, actually, and leave those characters behind. Thank you. Next question at the back. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask about the final part of the book, because when um, I loved my... Uh, I, I, my I, I loved that part where she has a sort of kind of acceptance, and she looks around at the demonstration at various people, and the political um, rally that she's at, and she sort of finds, it feels like to me that she sort of finds her home there, or, or, or it's the most, but the, the adaptation changes that quite a lot. Um, I just wondered if you knew, thought about, uh, if, you, if you knew about the thinking behind that, um, and I just wanted to ask when your next book's coming out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm always uh, desperate to read it. <laughs> um, Yes, the adaptation does change that. and I, I mean, the book ends with a big socialist rally in Victoria Park, which is a thinly disguised kind of gay pride, really, where, where you bump into all your exes, you know, <laughs> it's on the same day, um, and that what, which is what happens to Nancy. But no, I mean, it was important to me that it was a socialist rally as well, because it's very much a novel about you know, sort of finding community in the, in the widest possible sense, really, ultimately. Um, so, but I mean, but I mean, I think it would have been too expensive for the BBC to to film a, a big social, big rally anywhere, and so Andrew brought it back to the music hall at the end, and um, Nancy has to choose between uh, Kitty and her new love at the end of the book, at the very end of the book. I won't say which one she picks, but maybe I've <laughs> kind of said it already. Um, which I think probably for TV made a kind of neat conclusion. It sort of takes it back. To, to the musical world, which has been such a vivid part of the first episode. So I didn't, I didn't really mind that too much. I mean, one thing Andrew did do in, in the book was he, he sort of, in the book, um, sorry, in the adaptation, in the book, you know, by the, by the third part of the novel, Nancy meets a, a, a woman called Florence, or a girl called Florence, and, and has a thing with her. And Florence is very much a sort of a out and capable and, is, is already part of a kind of a Victorian lesbian subculture. And he kind of took that away and turned Florence into a bit of an ingenue, you know, and I, I felt at the time, I, I think this is because telly, mainstream telly, likes its lesbians to be innocent. You know, that's the story it likes. It's about innocence, finding, finding um, sex and, and, and love and community. I, it, it, it felt, to me, it seemed that it was less comfortable mainstream telly was less comfortable with just telling a, you know, a lesbian or queer story about people in their own queer community, you know, who'd already been through all that, and that they were, you know, so I, I, I did feel that a bit at the time. It seemed to me a bit of a shame. Um, but, but that was all, yeah. So, but apart from that, I, um, I, was, I was happy with the ending, really. Oh, and, and your second question about the new book. Oh, if only, if only it was finished. But it's, um, I'm still writing it, so I'm hoping to finish it by the end of the year if I can, but it's not gay, I'm afraid. It's not queer, it's not any kind of queer at all. It's a bit like my book before last, which was The Little Stranger, which is a sort of ghost story, which again isn't at all queer, or only in the kind of gothic sense. And this is a book like that, really. So there's no love or sex in it at all, and that's actually been quite hard, because love and sex is a great, it's apart from being a lovely pleasure and lots of, lots of moist kind of <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> It's, uh, it's also, also a great engine for, for a novel, so for a narrative. So when you haven't got that, your engine has to come in different ways. So I've slightly missed writing um, about love and desire. Maybe I'll go back to it next time, I don't know. We look forward to that. Um, we have time for one more question. There is one back there. One at the back. 
Hi, oh, sorry, I've just had my hand up and down. Um, I was just wondering, very short, um, whether you prefer the stage or screen adaptations of your work, generally. Ooh, I think they're just so different, stage and screen. I mean, st when I was, I've had, a f how many st stages have I had? There was Tipping the Velvet, and there was a lovely The Night Watch, actually, at M in Manchester a few years ago. And the great thing about theatre is it's different every night. I ended up going, it was like I was a sort of groupie to my own work or something, because <laughs> I think I saw Tipping the Velvet about seven times, because I went with sort of different sorts of, different groups of people in the end. And it was so fascinating, because it was different every night. You know, it was literally, the, 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 the show was different every night, because the performers would respond to the mood of the audience, and it was, uh, and some nights it was like raucous, and then some nights it was a bit subdued, and you couldn't really, didn't really know why. And, um, and one night there was like two women like practically having sex in one of the boxes <laughs> and uh, the management had to come and turf them out. It was, uh, <laughs> that was crazy. Um, so that, you know, that's exciting in a way. It's kind of alive in a way that telly isn't. But then, but then telly, when it's good, it can be, um, you know, sort of super kind of slick and when it works, it's, it, it, yeah, when, when I think it's just whether it's good or not, really. You know, good theatre is great and good telly is great. Um, but there is something special about theatre, yeah. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our Tipping the Velvet extravaganza. Um, it's been really special, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, so thank you to the Cinema Museum. Um, thank you to Uli at Gaze the Word Books. Um, an eternity of gratitude to you, Sarah, who will be, uh, there's a little bit of a plot. Okay, wait until the end, wait until the end. Um, you, you'll be signing books downstairs. We have a smaller cinema and just, if you're going to go out, it's like the last door on your left or the second to last. There's a sign anywhere. Anyway, so if you, yeah, if people wanna go and start queuing up down there. That's fine. Um, and lastly, thank you to you, the audience, and the readers for being here. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again in 25 years for the <laughs> 50th anniversary. Oh thank you, and get home safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.